Well, it is good to see you again this morning. Hope you've all had a good week. And again, if you don't have the Lord's Supper elements with you already, I hope you'll do that right now. We plan on doing that right after this morning's lesson. John will lead us in the prayers for that. And then Chris Archuleta will lead us in a song before we head outside to do our fellowshipping out there. If you're joining us online or on the phone, we're also glad that you can be with us. Most of you are able to see that uh, we are starting as we have for several months now with God's uh, plan of salvation. Just a brief summary of it up here on the screen. Uh, God sent his son as a sacrifice for our sins. We respond to that by believing what we read about it in the scripture, by turning away from sin, confessing Jesus as the son of God, and then by allowing ourselves to be buried with him in baptism. And once again, we have a few examples up here. We have two this morning. And the first one comes to us from the Myrtle Avenue Church of Christ in Long Beach, California, as Jesse is baptized this past week. And so we rejoice with Jesse and with his new Christian family out there in California. And then we also have a few pictures of Ms. Helen. And Helen is 90 years old, and she was baptized just a few days ago at the Sebring Avenue Congregation in Sebring, Florida. And so we've seen this uh, baptisms this morning, literally from east to west, haven't we? From one coast to the other, uh, from one side of the nation to the other, from California to Florida. And we're thankful for the good news this morning. And again, we're sharing these images by way of encouragement. And that is what Jesse and Miss Helen have done this week. Uh, you can also do this morning. If you have any questions about that or concerns, uh, we invite you to get in touch. If you're watching online, our contact information should be on the screen just under the video. And if you're listening on the phone and are not able to see what's going on here, uh, the church number is 608-224-0274. I hope you'll call or text me at that number and I'd be glad to discuss the scriptures with you. This morning, I would invite you to think with me about some of the most unfortunate times to fall asleep. Some of the worst times to fall asleep. Maybe some of you have heard someone say, that I would love to die peacefully in my sleep like my grandfather, not screaming like his passengers. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. We understand that while driving is obviously not a good time to fall asleep. And we may think of other times when we've struggled to stay awake, maybe in a class of some kind, or maybe while watching a movie. Some of you know that I will sometimes refer to a movie as a $9 nap a nine dollar nap and uh, i fight it but it's a nice peaceful rest sometimes to fall asleep at a movie we have several references in the bible to some strange things happening when people fall asleep uh, we think about adam who fell asleep back in the book of genesis and woke up missing a rib with a brand new woman there by his side when he awakens we think about sisera the Canaanite army commander who fell asleep and woke up with his head nailed to the ground in that tent. We think about Samson who fell asleep and woke up bald and beaten. We think about Jonah who fell asleep on a boat and woke up in a storm only to be thrown overboard and then swallowed by a great fish. We also think about Peter and James and John who kept falling asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we could make an entire series out of these. We could go through the Bible and study people who have fallen asleep at rather strange and unusual times. But this morning, I want to invite you to think with me about a young man who became famous for being the first person to ever fall asleep during a long sermon. And I'm referring to a young man by the name of Eutychus. And the account of his life is found in Acts chapter 20, verses 7 through 12. So I would invite you to turn with me to Acts 27 through 12. I know we often navigate our way through the Bible by focusing on the main characters, leaders like Abraham and Moses and David and Peter and Paul. And yet we also know that so much of the Bible becomes truly relevant as we read it and as we discover people in there like us. And Eutychus is one of these people who is like us. He's one of these minor characters. And so if you've ever been tempted to fall asleep during a long sermon, Eutychus is for you. And we can understand what he was going through. 
And what always impresses me here is that Luke, the author, calls out this young man by name. Luke, of course, could have very easily said there was this guy who fell asleep in the city of Troas. But he doesn't leave it there, does he? He gives us the young man's name. And so for the rest of eternity, Eutychus will forever be known as the young man who fell asleep during Paul's sermon. How embarrassing that must be, in a sense. And yet at the same time, what an honor that is as well, because he was there. And his name is forever recorded in Scripture. As I pointed out a number of times through the years, sometimes when somebody is identified by name in Scripture, it's often because they go on to be known in some way. There's a reason why the name is given. And so, you know, as we go into this, I'm at least open to the possibility that Eutychus goes on to become known in some way, maybe a preacher, an elder, or a missionary, something like that. In other words, by the time Luke writes this many years later, after the fact, he calls out Eutychus by name because his readers might know the man, and at least we need to be open to that possibility. Ah, oh, Eutychus, that's, that's one of our elders or something like that. Uh, he was there and he fell asleep. I'll admit that I have laughed quite a bit over the past uh, week or so as I've studied Eutychus. Um, my family may be a little bit concerned about me with uh, the laughter coming out of my uh, study in, in our house. Besides thinking about this guy being permanently called out in scripture like this for falling asleep, I've also thought about the challenge of preaching shorter sermons over the past several months. As you know, we're trying to keep the worship a bit shorter, and now here I am uh, this morning doing the best I can to preach a short sermon on a long sermon that was actually so long that it killed the guy. And so I've got a laugh out of that a few times this week. So over the past few months, uh, I've thought about quite a bit about the time when Woodrow Wilson was asked by a member of his cabinet about his short speeches. And the man asked how long it took him to prepare those speeches. And the president said this, it depends. If I am to speak 10 minutes, I need a week to prepare. If 15 minutes, I need three days. If half an hour, two days. If you want me to speak for an hour, I am ready right now. That's always interesting to me. You may think that a short speech takes less time to prepare than a longer speech, but that is not necessarily the case. And you know my dad was a speech teacher in high school uh, for the first 10 years of his uh, adult life, and so that, I was born into that. So I remember hearing this quote uh, a number of times through the years. So again, here I am trying to preach a short sermon about a sermon that was so long that it killed a guy. And I've just had some interesting thoughts about that uh, this week. By way of background, we want to know Paul is on his third and final missionary journey. He's on his way back to Jerusalem to deliver some famine relief. So he's been collecting funds from Gentile congregations to deliver back to Jerusalem to their Jewish brothers and sisters. And so it's an interesting switch uh, how the Jews first were not accepting of the Gentiles, and now the Gentiles are sending money uh, back to Jerusalem for famine relief. So he's in a hurry on this trip. It's a critical situation. He needs to get this help back but he takes the time to stop in the city of Troas. Troas is a port city on the far northwest side of Asia Minor, a modern day Turkey. And he apparently just misses a Lord's Day assembly. And so he stays in Troas for a week in order to catch the next one. It's that important that he be together with these people on the first day of the week. And this brings us to Acts 20. So let's look this morning, Acts 20 verses 7 through 12. Acts 20, 7 through 12. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting in the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep, and as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him. And after embracing him, he said, do not be troubled for his life is in him. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. This morning, as we look at these few verses, I want us to ask, why is this story so important 
so as to be included in the book of Acts. Why did the Holy Spirit include this here? And specifically, what can we learn from Eutychus? What can we take away from this? And I would make several observations on this passage, starting with the fact that Eutychus sees the importance of coming together as a church to break bread and to hear the word of God. So yes, Eutychus falls asleep. He dies during a sermon by the Apostle Paul. But Eutychus is there. Along with the rest of the church, Eutychus comes together on the first day of the week for the purpose of breaking bread. And we learn from this that the early church was in the habit of doing this. This was their custom. They were there, not because Paul was there, but instead Paul was there because they were there. I hope that makes sense. This was not a special time just to meet Paul. Paul went out of his way spending extra time in Troas so as he could be there on the first day of the week when they were gathered together for the purpose of breaking bread. In fact, Acts 20 verse 7 is one of the few passages indicating that the early church met on the first day of the week. And really, if it weren't for Eutychus falling asleep, we probably wouldn't even have this reference. So I find that interesting. We can be thankful that this happened so that we have this reference to the early church coming together on the first day. Some of you uh, may remember the ABCs of Acts. We studied the book of Acts starting in the Bussy's living room back in uh, April of 2000. That was the first book of the Bible that we studied together as a group. And we studied the ABCs of Acts, where we had one letter for each uh, chapter in the book. So A, chapter 1, was the ascension. B, chapter 2, is the beginning of the church, and so on, continuing through the alphabet. Well, the letter for chapter 20 is T. And that stands for Troas on the Lord's Day. Troas on the Lord's Day. So we find here that the early church comes together on the first day of the week, the day of the Lord's resurrection, the day the church began in Acts chapter 2. It is the Lord's Day. And even when traveling, even when simply passing through this area, Paul knows that the church would be meeting, and Eutychus knew it as well. And even as a young man, he made a point of being there. I would also briefly point out that the name Eutychus basically means fortunate, fortunate or lucky. Some scholars have pointed out that this was a common name for slaves in the first century. And so it's possible then that Eutychus is a slave. And that certainly helps to explain why the church most likely meets in the evening. They meet when most members could come together. And it wasn't nine o'clock on a Sunday morning. Everybody would have been working then. Instead, they met together most likely after work as the sun was going down. So if this is true, that helps explain why Eutychus is so tired. It also helps to explain the need for many lamps. The reason is they were meeting in the evening. And yet, even though they had other obligations, work to do, children to care for, and all of this, they still managed to be together as a church all night long. For the Lord's Supper, to hear a long sermon from Paul, and then also for some extended teaching and fellowship all the way until daybreak the following morning. So this reminds us that the early church meets on the first day of the week. But also, it tells us that they meet at a time on the first day of the week whenever they could get together. I know today, generally speaking, we have the luxury of saying, hey, let's meet at 9 o'clock and 1030. That's very easy for us to do because most of us are off on Sunday morning. But in Troas, in the mid-60s AD, on the western side of the modern-day nation of Turkey, the church met at night because that is when they could meet. Most of them were not able to meet during the day on Sunday. When we first moved to Janesville, I went through all of the old files. And I mentioned this a few weeks ago in another context, but as I was going through those file cabinets full of old clippings and advertisements from back when the church was established in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, I remember finding newspaper ads clippings from gospel meetings in the 50s and 60s where the church would have gospel meetings and they would meet every day of the week at 5 or 6 a.m. for their gospel meetings and then they would meet again at 6 or 7 in the evening and I'm sure this was hard on the guest speaker to preach twice like that spread out 12 hours through the day I can't remember having a gospel meeting can you where we had a service at 5 in the morning I've never even considered such a thing we wouldn't do that today but in Janesville, Wisconsin, back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, 
people would come to hear the gospel preached. They would invite their friends at five or six in the morning. And they did that because of the GM plant down there, 5,000 people employed at the plant, the main employer. And they worked the gospel meeting around the shifts that people would work in the plant. And so worship and study might not always be convenient, but it is incredibly important. I also think about growing up in the Chicago area and what we would refer to as area-wide meetings. Basically, once a month on a Monday night, we would meet together at one of the area churches in the Chicagoland area for the purpose of hearing the Word of God explained to us. And there we could cover some very in-depth topics. Monday, of course, was a school night. Some of those churches in the Chicagoland area were more than an hour away from each other, sometimes up to two hours away or more. And we wouldn't get home until late at night but we knew that study was important. And so we met together. And that's pretty much what we find here in Acts chapter 20. And so we learn from this, first of all, that Eutychus as a young man is present. He knows the importance of remembering Jesus in the supper. He knows the importance of hearing the word. And he also knows the importance of fellowship with God's people. He knows that worship is important. As we go back to the text, let's also notice that Eutychus succumbs to human weakness. And I know <laughs> succumb is not a word that I use very often. I never use this word except for this morning, really, but it really describes what happens here. In a sense, he gives in to human weakness. But the more I look at that, that it seems like he's giving up. And that's really not what Eutychus is doing here. It's almost seeming to blame Eutychus if we say that he's giving in. Succumb really seems to be a better way of describing that. I looked up the word and the background of it, the etymology, and it comes from Latin and Old French and literally means to lie down under. And so if you look at the word succumb, you've heard of a, like a recumbent bicycle? you know, where you're biking and you're kind of laying down. It's the same root word, but it's the idea of laying down or maybe to be fatally overcome by something to the point where you're forced to lay down. We hear the news today and somebody's injured in an attack and maybe later they'll say that the person succumbed to their injuries. They weren't just giving up. They wanted to live, but because the body was weak, because the injuries were so severe, they succumbed to their injuries. And so I would say, a similar thing happens here. What I'm trying to say is Eutychus is human and humans need sleep. And Eutychus, as eager as he is to partake of the Lord's Supper, as eager as he is to listen to the Apostle Paul, he falls asleep. And I feel like I need to make a point of this because I have read some absolutely terrible interpretations of this passage over the past week or so. I've done a lot of reading on Acts 27 through 12. And I've seen people use this passage as a way of condemning people for falling asleep in church. And so they'll come away from this passage with the idea, if you fall asleep in church, you deserve to fall out a window. I mean, I can't believe it. I've actually read stuff like that this week, that kind of thing. I've seen people blame Satan for this. And I read it over and I'm like, I don't see Satan in there. But the idea is Satan pushed him out the window in order to make a distraction to take away from the preaching of the Apostle Paul. I've seen them blame God for this. God pushed him out the window because he wasn't paying attention to the sermon. And I kept thinking, no, that's not in there. That's not what Luke is trying to communicate. This is not what this passage is teaching. And I can say this safely because Luke, the author, he doesn't say anything like this. And also, on the scene, as it happens, Paul doesn't seem to blame anybody. When Paul goes down, he, he's not shaking his finger at Eutychus, you know, how dare you fall asleep in my sermon or anything like that. That's not what's going on. And so, I think we read this passage over and over, and we come to the conclusion that the young man is tired. Isn't that what's happening here? He's tired. He succumbs to human weakness. He's been working all day. There's a good chance of that. There's a good chance he needs to work the next day. And so I think we come away from this passage understanding that Eutychus is a mere mortal. He's a human being who gets tired. And again, I'm thinking of Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, as Jesus keeps finding them asleep, obviously Jesus is frustrated. He's disappointed by that. But ultimately, the Lord realizes, doesn't he, that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
that comes from that context. Jesus understands. I know you want to do what's right here, but he also realizes that we've got a human body. And so I believe also in the same way, Eutychus has a good heart. He's there. He's on the first day of the week. He wants to see Paul. He wants to partake of the supper. But that good heart is simply in a human body. Going back to the text, Luke, a medical doctor, uh, seems to describe a progression. And I missed this the first time reading through this. But notice in verse 9, he describes Eutychus sinking into a deep sleep. And then as Paul keeps on talking, he is overcome by sleep. Haven't we all had that sinking feeling of wanting to stay awake, wanting to finish the movie or whatever it is, wanting to drive to the next destination, but we keep sinking and the sleep is falling over us. We, we fight it, but it's coming. And ultimately there's nothing that we can do about it. Not only that, but Luke as a doctor, he also makes sure we know that there are many lamps in that upper room. And that's interesting for a medical doctor to point out. I'm thinking, obviously, fumes, right? Lack of oxygen, carbon monoxide or whatever. And so we have a few things going on here. But the point is, Eutychus is human. Yes, we can criticize Eutychus, but I find it interesting that Paul doesn't and Luke doesn't. There's nothing negative said about this young man because Eutychus is present for worship. When's the last time any of us were here in this building listening to preaching at midnight? I don't think I've ever been in this building at midnight. And so Eutychus is doing something that many of us still even do not do uh, today. And I know we might criticize the size of our building, but when has it been so crowded that any of us has had to sit in a windowsill to find a space? I find that interesting as well. It was perhaps that crowded. Uh, some have suggested that he might have been something of a lookout uh, keeping an eye out on those who might be coming. And I'll tell you, this is something that I've tried to keep in mind as a preacher through the years. When I see people fall asleep in church, <laughs> I never take it personally. I don't know what you went through last night. I don't know what medications you might be on or what medical conditions you might have. I can promise you, I will never be offended. But instead, I am glad that you're here. We've had parents of young children who were up all night. We've had people work through the night. Uh, in Janesville, we had a member who worked as a horticultural therapist with the developmentally disabled. She would grow tomatoes in a greenhouse as a form of therapy. She would show up on Wednesday evening in her coveralls covered in black tar from the tomato sap. I don't know if you've ever been covered in black tar from tomatoes, uh, but it's a real thing. I've never worked with tomatoes that much so as to be covered, but her coveralls were black from working among those tomatoes. She would pull into the church driveway. She would break open her bag of McDonald's in the parking lot and eat that quickly before running in for class after having worked for the past 12 hours. I have nothing but admiration for that godly woman. Of all the people who could have justified going home for a shower and to crash in bed, she's at the top of that list, working with the developmentally disabled all day in that environment year round. But she came to Bible class anyway. We've had people here in Madison work all night and then show up here after work at nine o'clock in the morning. If you snooze during worship, I will make two promises. Number one, I will never be offended. And number two, I promise to wake you up before locking up for the week. Uh, those are the two deals. Uh, I hope I'm not the only one to admit this, but I see a tiny bit of humor in this passage. Maybe I'm just weird, but I appreciate the humanity of what we read here. It happens to all of us. It's also a bit comforting to me as a preacher. If the Apostle Paul can lose somebody, <laughs> then who am I to think that it might not happen here? We're all human on the preaching end and also on the receiving end. But thankfully, Eutychus' weakness allowed all of those assembled together that day to get a small glimpse of God's power. And that leads us to the third and final big idea this morning, that God uses Eutychus to demonstrate his power to restore, his power to make things right, and his power to fix this. We see God in this passage, in the resurrection itself, also in the church coming together afterwards. I guess I need to start by saying that Eutychus is indeed dead. 
um, we think, well, of course, the Bible says that he is. And yet there are many articles out there suggesting that the young man is simply knocked unconscious, that he gets the wind knocked out of him, that he has a concussion or some injury of some kind. And Paul goes down and basically performs CPR of some kind and brings him back from the brink. But we look at this passage and we have to come to the conclusion that no, Eutychus is dead. And I can say that safely because of the we up in verse 7. In the book of Acts, whenever we have a we in the passage, it means that Luke is there. Luke then is an eyewitness. And again, we know that Luke is a medical doctor. Paul refers to him later as Luke, the beloved physician. And I would emphasize here that in Luke's professional medical opinion, the young man is dead. And the word that he uses in verse 9 is necros. And Luke, if he thought he was simply unconscious, if he thought he was just knocked out or had the wind knocked out of him, he would have said so. But that's not what he says. He falls from the third floor and he is dead, according to Dr. Luke. So Paul goes down and he falls upon him and embraces him. That's a bit strange, isn't it? That's really weird. Until we realize that Elijah and Elisha both do something very similar twice back in first kings 17 and also second kings 4 uh, both a young man and a grown man are dead in two different circumstances they embrace them or stretch out on top of them and they come back to life and paul seems to do something similar here with similar results and eutychus comes back from the dead as paul says do not be troubled for his life is in him by the way that's very similar to what jesus says when he raises jairus's daughter from the dead Eutychus then is brought to his Christian family, and they are greatly comforted in the New American Standard. Or more literally, in some translations, as they pointed out, they are not a little comforted. And so it is a figure of speech. What I also need to point out here is that Paul goes right back to preaching, doesn't he? He doesn't take this as a clue to limit his preaching, but he continues until daybreak the following morning. His word is confirmed by the resurrection. That is the purpose of miraculous gifts in the New Testament. And at some point later that night or the wee hours of the morning, the Bible says they all eat a meal together. What an example for us as a congregation. They spend the whole night together. But the main idea here is what happens to Eutychus allows God to do what God does. He restores. He makes things right. He fixes this. I've never preached on Eutychus before, which I find surprising myself. And as I said, there are some weird interpretations of this passage out there. But I believe that we've treated it fairly this morning. We haven't read anything into the text, but I think we've got some lessons out of it, some things that should apply to us today. As we close, I want to just briefly point out that about four years after this occasion, Paul is under house arrest in Rome. He writes to the church in Ephesus, not too far from Troas, and he quotes from Isaiah in a passage that absolutely has to remind him of what happened back in Troas. He says, for this reason, it says, awake sleeper and rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. And that's our prayer today. That's what we come away from this passage thinking. Early this morning, as I was at Cottage Cafe, there was a, a man who pulled me aside at the counter and uh, found out his name is Dave. But Dave came up and said, you're the preacher for that church up there, aren't you? I don't remember ever meeting this man before, but for some reason he recognized me as being a part of this congregation. And he said, would you guys be able to say a special prayer for our nation right now? And he was asking that we pray for the situation out in Portland and also in Austin and, and right here in Madison as well. Some of you know there's been another shooting overnight uh, down on the southwest side, not far from us, uh, where one young man was killed. It's just, it's a mess out there, isn't it? So let's go to God in prayer before we partake of the Lord's Supper and let's remember these things. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, the only one with the power to raise up from the dead. This morning, we're thankful for Eutychus, 
for his dedication and example in coming together with his Christian family for worship. We're thankful also for his example of humanity. We're thankful that your word tells us both the good and the bad so that we can learn from the example of others who are just like us with the same weaknesses that we have. We're also thankful this morning for your power to make things right, for your power to restore. With this in mind, we also pray this morning, especially for our nation and for the unrest that we continue to experience. We pray that we might be able to settle differences between us without violence, without the loss of life, if at all possible. With this in mind, we also pray for the authorities in our nation, if you have commanded us to do. We pray for them, that you be with our rulers, that you bless them with wisdom, so that we might continue personally as your people to live quiet lives with all godliness and dignity. Be with us as we encourage each other this week. Thank you for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen. It's time for us to partake of the Lord's Supper. And as I was thinking about Baxter's lesson just now, thinking about how Eutychus was overtaken by a, a common human frailty, I'm so thankful that God took that into account when he established this memorial for us, our human frailty of forgetfulness. We, we tend to forget things if we're not reminded often. And so this memorial service was inserted into our acceptable worship as a weekly reminder of the sacrifice that that Jesus made on our behalf. So with that in mind, let's look at Corinthians chapter 1 Corinthians chapter 11 starting at verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes we should never forget the tremendous sacrifice that was given on our behalf. We should always be mindful of how we live day to day and just always be uh, cognizant of the great price that was paid for our sins. A price that we can't pay ourselves, but Christ paid it in his body and in his blood. And so with that in mind, let's, let's go to God in prayer. Our holy and righteous Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your com concern for us. We thank you that we are your people. We thank you that you are our God. We pray, Father, that as we partake of this bread this morning, we'll remember the sacrifice that was given on our behalf for a price that we couldn't pay. We pray that we will examine our lives at this moment and through the remainder of this week and always strive to live in a way that lets your light shine in our lives. Help us to partake of this bread in a manner pleasing in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue our thanks. Glorious Father in heaven, we 
thank you for this fruit of the vine. We pray that as we partake of this, we'll let our minds go back and remember the blood of Christ that was given as the perfect and lasting purchase price for our sins, a price that we could never pay ourselves. We pray, Father, that as we partake, we will do so in a manner pleasing in your sight. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Yeah. 